Oh, we have lots of pumps and burners in there. That's no big deal. Yeah, it was... Uh, I think it was that one we did. Which one did we do? Oh, was it the one with a little bit of liquid that we vaporized? Yep. Yeah. Oh, we so didn't we didn't vaporize even... remaining liquid. Okay, yeah, so we didn't even get to this. So, do we need to look at that problem some more? Yes. That was this one. With uh, a little bit of liquid in here. Is it that one? Mm -hmm. Where we yeah. had. Uh, mm -hmm. It just seems so long ago. Uh, the whole volume of the tank was five meters cubed. Yes. Right? This is that one. Yep. Okay. Pressure and is 0 0.1 megapascals. Uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.05 of that volume is the liquid. And the rest was vapor and the whole pressure was 0.1 atmosphere. Uh, mega mega pass outs, yeah. And then then uh, then we heat that. That was the deal, right? Yep. And so uh, on a on a, a TV diagram, what's that look like? That that uh, process, starting with a, this little bit of liquid. And a whole lot of vapor, at least by volume. What did that process look like on the TV diagram? Start under the dome, obviously, because we have both faces present at one megapascal, wherever that might happen to be. So start there somewhere, and don't know just what the uh, we don't know yet just what the uh, quality is, but we know we're under the dome somewhere, a good healthy distance under the zone dome, and then vaporize at constant volume simply because it was a rigid tank, so the volume can't change and up to the point of vaporization. Get in the habit of, uh, of these when you can, of drawing the, the uh, process. It helps you think through the problem a little bit. It's very easy in thermo because there's lots of choices to make at different times to just jump into the problem when you might not really have thought about it right. Okay, so we needed to find out how much heat needed to be added to get it to go from point one to point two. Right? That's the problem? Okay. We have at our disposal now one of the most important of the uh, formulas we're going to work with. In fact, one of the most important in your young lives. And that's the first law. Which takes generally that form. That that's the steady state um, closed system form. So there's no mass flow in or out, which is why we just have a, a single mass there. <laughs> and then we're looking for uh, um, how much heat is added. So we're actually looking for this term. Could be that some heat is being lost by this system, but it doesn't matter. What we're looking for is, is the net heat transfer to the system. As usual, with any of the first law type equations, just like when we had, a, actually I didn't call this the first law in, in physics, um, we didn't have a heat transfer term, we only had to work doing certain things. Um, but this idea 
here is the same thing. Go through and make whatever you can zero so the problem just gets smaller and smaller right from the start. Anything? Work. Is the work zero? Yes. yes. Why? Constant volume is one reason, so there's no boundary work being done. Remember we talked uh, yesterday, or uh, uh, the other day, about boundary work being PDV work. And it's a definite integral, since we, we go between two points. Um, that's certainly true with a rigid tank like we have here. The boundaries can't move at all. There can't be any boundary work then. But there's also no other forms of work that we have in here. We don't have any paddles in there stirring things up. We don't have any resistors uh, with uh, electricity coming in to heat those up. Remember reading through that was considered work being done on the system. We don't have any of those kind of things. So the work uh, then is zero. The network is zero. Anything else? Yeah, the, the system is not changing height. Uh, yes, there's a little bit of change in the center of mass of the system. It's going to increase. A, uh, it's going to go up a little bit because so much of the mass is at the bottom to start with. But that's not significant. And uh, we assume the system is moving uh, as a whole. Yes, there is molecular movement. And if you took thermodynamics in a physics class rather than an engineering class, you would uh, look at the kinetic energy of the molecules as well to some measure. For us, that all resides in here is the temperature. OK, so that's the two pieces we had. And then uh, the need was to find We need to find the internal energy, because if we have those two things, well, we need to find the mass, but also need to find the internal energy of the, uh, of the two things. Usually that means establishing the state points. If we can fix these state points, we can get those used. We know the M, and, then, uh, or we can, and we can find the M. We can then get the whole, uh, the whole system there. So what else, though? What can we do to fix the state points? We've got the pressure. We need some other independent variable to fix the state points. Yeah, if we can find the specific volume, anything but temperature will work. But the, really, the only thing else we have is specific volume, because it's the only thing we have going uh, any information on is the volume. So if we can find the specific volume of state point one, we could find the uh, we could then find the uh, state point. In fact, we could use that as well for. Uh, Point two. In fact, that, that may well be the second uh, parameter we need. Um, how do we find that? Uh, I guess anytime under the dome, VF plus X VFG will help if we've got those things. Can we get VF? Sure. We have pressure. We have pressure. Remember, VF is not specific to the state point, but specific to the line on which the state point uh, exists. And so there's VF um, for point one. So we've got that. And in the same way, we can get VG. So we can get. VFG. 
g. But that doesn't give us the quality. These two things just come out of the saturated pressure table for water. Quality, we either need or need some other way to come up with this. So what do we do? Well, you know the volume of vapor, you know the volume of liquid. Yep. Yeah. We know the, the total volume of each. If we knew the mass of each, then we could get the specific volume that way. Well, in fact, that's what we have. We have the volume of the liquid. We know the specific volume. Or can look it up. We don't happen to have it on hand. That will allow us to find the mass for each of those. Same thing for the gas, the vapor. We can find each of those. So did we actually look up VF and VG for this problem? table do we look at? We're under the dome, which means we use one of the saturated tables, saturated water. We have pressure, so we use the saturated water pressure table. Which is table A5. And we're 0.1 megapascals which is 100 uh, kilopascals. And so we're, we're right there. So there's VF, and there's VG, the difference between the two, which notice the gigantic size difference between these. Uh, if you're in a great hurry, then VFG is going to be very, very close to uh, VG itself. But uh, we have those two values then. VF at 0.1 megapascals, 001043. So we can find the mass. because we know the mass of the fluid from that. So that comes out to be 47.94. Remember, we're trying to find out the mass of the two of them so we know the total mass of the system and so we can find the quality and that's established state point one. And in the same way for the mass of the gas, what is it? 2.95 kilograms. Um, every, everybody's getting used to looking at these tables. When we go through these problems, you should have your table open or certainly be looking at this one. Don't just let this stuff pass you by because you'll waste scads of time on tests, especially tests that aren't missing a problem so they're going to take longer next time. What? And so now we know the total mass. From that we can also get the, uh, <coughs> the quality. And that establishes then the state point and we can figure out everything else we need to know. Total mass is 50.86. And
again, we can figure out the quality. Um, actually, a quicker way to do this one is we could also, from these points, uh, for, at least for point one, just use the values right off the table. Either one, either one will do. Algebraically, there's no difference between those. It's just a matter of which one you prefer to do. Either one of those will work. You can put in the definition of quality here, and then after a couple steps of algebra, you'll come up with this exact equation or otherwise, other, other direction, whichever one you want. But that establishes state point one. specific volume and we know it's at saturated conditions so once we find the specific volume which we would have had here and it turns out to be 0 0.098 meters cubed per kilogram <coughs> we go to the to the table. We're not sure what the pressure is because uh, we've done all that vaporizing, but we now do, do know what the what the volume of the liquid phase or the uh, the vapor phase is because that's all we have left. So we go to 0 0.098 on the saturated pressure table. Actually, you can do it on the temperature table too. It doesn't matter. You're just going to the dome when you go down this column. Point oh. Here's here's point oh nine nine and point oh eight eight. So we're a little bit somewhere in between those two. Maybe maybe at twenty one hundred degrees, give or take a little bit. But that also gives you the pressure then, which wasn't asked for, but there it is. Oh no, that, that was the pressure I was reading off. Okay, but we're going to this specific volume since V1 equals V2. Just picking that off the table under the, the V sub G cat uh, column. Any number we pick specifically right off of that column is putting us right on the dome. That's what these values are. We sketch out the dome. So it looks like we're right about there. Maybe there's a tidier number. Uh, not any better really on the temperature table. So you have to estimate it a little bit. Whichever one is closer, it doesn't matter terribly. So we're at about 2100 kPa and maybe 213 to 214 degrees. Uh, but 
but more importantly for us, now that we know about where we are, that gives us use of G. So, oh look, these barely change anyway, so who cares where we are in between those two? Just make it 2600, and it's easy. So U2, then right off the table, twenty six hundred, and we can finish the problem. So now I have now have U1 and M times U2 will be U2, and we can finish the problem. And I think that's all it asks is is the change in internal energy, which is the heat transfer. 105 megajoules. Okay, on the table, what are you doing on that table? Shopping around for new numbers, just in case there aren't enough? Yeah, we're not in superheat. We're stopping at the dome, so we don't need the superheat tables. All right, with that one then, and that's the one. That's where we finished Wednesday, according to Alan. Hey guys, uh, I do a question. U yeah. one, big U one. Yeah. Where you've got it simplified over on the right, using m times U F minus x U F G. Uh huh. Can we do that with U two? No. In any way. Well, yeah, kind of. You, you kind of can because uh, U2, look at it in just the same way. Uh, now, this is all at state point one because at state point two, there's different values for these. Uh, so if we did MF, UF plus MG. UG, oops, G. Okay. Alan's question was can we just do this at state point two, right? So if we do this at state point two, how much mass at state point two is liquid? None is. That was the whole problem. We vaporize all of the liquid to the dome. That means all of the mass is vapor and we use U sub G, which is exactly what I pulled off the table here. It's U sub G. This is U sub G at state point two. So they are the same. It's just that there's no liquid. So that phase doesn't even factor into it. And then this piece is that. <coughs> so yeah, we can do the same thing. It's just you just since M the vapor, the liquid phase is zero, the mass of the liquid phase is zero, you end up with the same thing. Okay? All right, because we need to step on to some new stuff now. Not that this stuff disappears, we're just going to add to it a little bit. We're going to increase our ability, if you will, to calculate this delta U business that clearly we need because it's a big part of the first law. In fact, if you remember, this work net part can be, um, maybe we call other work plus the boundary work we are just looking at. Uh, well, not on this problem, but a little bit before. This problem happened to have a rigid tank, so we didn't have any boundary work. 
this, if you remember, equals P delta V. And so we can take that over to the other side. And by other, I mean shaft work, uh, electrical work. Um, I guess that's the only kinds we've had here. That comes over to the other side. And again, if you remember, we had this combination U plus PV appearing time and time again. So we made a convenience definition of it. Who remembers what that is? This combination of U plus PV appears a lot. H. The enthalpy. So that this then becomes delta H. When there's boundary work. If there isn't, then delta V is zero and we're just back to delta U. So our ability to find delta H and delta U are important. We have the tables, at least for water, uh, R134, and I think our I think we have uh, I think we have ammonia in there, I'm not sure. Um, but we don't have a bunch of tables for the enthalpy and internal energy of gases. However, let's look back at the state postulate. Sounds like one of those guys who used to follow Jesus in the wilderness. <laughs> Doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, sure does. State what was the state postulate? Apostle. State apostle. We need two intensive properties. We need two intensive independent properties to define a state point. Now, T and V are always independent. There was no place under the dome to the left or to the right they weren't independent. So we can therefore define any state point if we had T and V themselves together. For example, we could do U as a function of T and V. And in fact, uh, that's basically uh, a lot of what the tables are. It's just since T and P aren't independent under the dome, we can also do uh, P is V as a function of V, but we'll do, we'll do with that. So again, look, we're, we're looking for that change in the intensive, uh, in the internal energy. So we can take the derivative of it, because it's function of two variables, we have to do a partial differential. Have you guys done partial differentials at all? Yeah. yeah. A couple times, sometimes. Okay. A uh, couple people here haven't, but I'll, I'll just review that part of it. So we hold one of the one of the variables constant, and I'll, I'll show why, what I mean by held constant in a second, and uh, derivate with respect to the other, and then redo it for the other combination. So we have those two. Partial differential, let's see, we, we've got three quantities here. 
and so there's going to be some kind of graph we could imagine, u and t and v, that'll give us a three-dimensional surface of some kind, and uh, maybe it looks something like that, just to make up a shape for it. So we have some three-dimensional surface like that. That's not too bad, is it? Not too bad. Nah. I'm not asking you guys. I'm asking <laughs> my friend Jonathan. So if we hold one of these values constant, it means we set up a plane where that value is constant. So this is a plane of <coughs> constant v, for example. And then this derivative is the slope of that plane, at least that surface on that plane, uh, in the other direction. Oops, I drew that the wrong direction. This is actually constant t, isn't it? That's a, that's a, so that's this one here. So we're holding t constant, that gives us a line, and then the slope of that line at any place. The slope of that line is then du, d, as it changes in the v direction, at constant t. We don't have to actually do this derivative. They're all done there in the, in the book, in the tables and the like. In fact, we're going to see where they are shortly here. One other thing that simplifies this a lot is the fact that this second part of it is essentially zero. There's very little change in the internal energy with change in volume. Uh, U is a, a very weak function of volume. It's a very strong function of temperature. So we're pretty much left with du equals this partial with respect to uh, temperature at constant volume. This does not mean a constant volume process. It means we're looking at this, this uh, the behavior of this fluid in a, uh, a constant volume plane. Does not mean the process is constant volume. This we define then as the specific heat at constant volume along a plane of constant volume. Again, not the process at constant V. Uh, I'll go ahead and put that in. Constant V plane. So that's just on the data graph. Has nothing to do with the process specifically itself. The reason that's useful is this can be picked out of all the scads of data that people have done for different fluids. And this then is a characteristic of the material uh, of the fluid itself. And by fluid I don't mean liquid. I mean any substance will take the shape of its own container, which means liquid or gas or vapor. Characteristic of the fluid, that means we can look it up in the table. So all we need to do is uh, work on that in a second here. So we can now find this change in internal energy by integrating the specific heat uh, 
with respect to temperature. If we know the temperature change and we know the specific heat, we could do this integral and find the change in internal energy. So the question then becomes finding C sub B. And we have it in several different ways. Just in case you never have enough choices on these problems as you're going through them. You're always thinking, is there some other way I could have to find this thing? So, first choice available is the second table, A2. Ideal gas specific heat for various common gases. We don't really need this for water because we have the water tables. They've got U right in there. But for calculating delta U, it's useful for various gases. Notice this is at a specific temperature. That's about room temperature, 300 degrees K. And there's, oops, it's off the chart. There's C sub V right there. And the units that go right with this, kilojoules per kilogram per degree K. And so if we're uh, working with a specific gas, we just look the gas up, go over, and there's C sub D there. At room temperature, C sub D changes with temperature. Uh, this, however, might be a very nice first approximation, or you might be working at low temperatures, so that would be fine. If not, then you need to go to the specific heats as a function of temperature, which is just the next table. Here's a, a couple gases, air, carbon dioxide, etc. There's C sub B, and there's the function of temperature. So if you're doing it at different temperatures, then you can use the C sub V off the table that's a little bit better for that temperature. Notice it does change some. Now typically, we're looking for the change in terminal energy between two temperatures. If the temperatures don't change very much, you know, if we're only talking about 50 degrees or something, that's not a very big change there. Just average the temperatures and then use that for the, uh, at, you can average the, uh, the uh, specific heat as well, and that will, that will generally suffice. We'll do a problem where we do the different ways. If the temperature changes are rather big, then we have here the specific heat as a function of temperature, and I'll talk about that a little bit in a second. So, um, I think that was table A2A at room temperature. A2, table A2B at several temperatures. And A2, uh, C has C sub, uh, well actually I'll talk about that in a second, that one, in a second. Because you may have noticed on the chart there wasn't just C sub B, there was also C sub P. C sub P is the very same thing done for enthalpy. Enthalpy is a function of temperature and, sorry, temperature and pressure. Remember, it's a combination of U plus PV, so it becomes much more temperature, a function of temperature. And so we can do the partial differential again. 
in the same way we did for u, only for h. Turns out that it's very low dependence on pressure. So then we also get delta H equals the first find that. That's the constant, that's the specific heat along a plane of constant pressure. And so this becomes then delta H equals integral of dH, which is the integral of C sub e dt between two temperatures. So if we're looking for internal energy, use C sub e. If we're looking for enthalpy, use C sub e. Remember this constant volume and constant pro pressure reference does not refer to the process. It refers to the uh, plane along which these, this data was taken. And so in table A2C is the functional form. It's just a curve fit of C sub B as a function of temperature. And that's exactly what you see in this table. Well, not exactly what you see in this table. Notice it's not per kilogram, it's per kilogram mole. And so our symbol for that is a little bar over. Uh, but that's not too, that's not too much trouble. You have to multiply it by its uh, molecular weight, and you get it in terms of kilograms. So finding C sub B and C sub P, since they're both in in most of these tables. There's C sub P and C sub V. <laughs> Here in the temperature table, there's C sub P and C sub V. And then for the function, and this is just a table of all the coefficients that go into this best fit. It's just a polynomial, third order polynomial. Um, that just happens to be C sub P only, and it happens to be in kilojoules, kilo K moles, kilomoles, whack a moles, degree Kelvin. Watch the temperature. That's the thing that can screw you up the most. Also, there is a temperature range given, and it shows you, gives you a little bit idea what the error is on the, the curve fit, which is pretty insignificant. The last thing that can help you with this is that there's uh, another uh, coefficient defined is called the ratio of specific heats. It's just simply C sub P divided by C sub B. And if you look at the tables, that's exactly what that number is. C sub P divided by C sub B, and that's that value K. If you happen to have one and not the other, for example, if you have this table only, and you need C sub B instead, you can just multiply it by K for that gas. Oh, I guess another way to get these values is uh, they're also available in E's, because E's will just look up these tables for us. summarize these. A 
and then we'll do a couple problems with them. So just rewriting what I had there in earlier form. Wait, that's not right. This one's down here. And if I haven't emphasized it enough, let me do it again. This constant volume and constant pressure business does not refer to the process. It refers to whether or not you need delta U or delta H only. For small delta T, Generally, all you need to do is treat these two as constant at maybe a T average, or if you're in a real hurry, just use one temperature or the other and take it right off the table. You'll notice as you go through some of these problems, they really don't change very much. But they, they do increase the accuracy a little bit. Those tables were for gases. For liquids, it gets to be a lot easier because V is really a function of temperature only, as is U, as is H. Not the same function for the three of them, of course, but uh, just saying that the other pressure and uh, the mostly pressure doesn't really play a part in this. And so these are essentially equal and so we don't even put a subscript on them. And I think we I think we have the specific heat of several liquids in here. And I can't even remember. Uh, no, we don't appear to unless I'm just skipping over it. There's a lot of tables in there. Uh, just take it as, as constant. In fact, that's pretty good for any incompressible substance. And liquid water is, for the most part, incompressible. As is rubber. Rubber is essentially incompressible. Yeah, everybody thinks, well, you know, I can squeeze rubber and push it around all the The thing is, though, if you restrain it from pushing out when you push down in one direction, if you restrain it and try to compress it, it's very incompressible if it's, if it's uh, all of its dimensions. Well, as some of us know, you hold it from doing uh, the kind of expa uh, change in shape that we did for Poisson's Ratio. Remember that? No, you don't. What else is incompressible? Besides uh, the water. It's such a Josh's arm biceps. <laughs> uh, almost all solids are. Uh, most liquids are. For our purposes, everything but gases, vapors, and gases. Okay, so we'll, uh, we'll dance through this a little bit with a simple problem. Just to get used to pulling things out of these tables. Uh, that's one of the hardest part of getting used to these, these classes. Alright, so let's imagine oxygen being heated from... Um, 800 to 1500 
degrees Rankine. That's absolute temperature in the in the English units. So uh, for those of you who have the international edition, you don't have these precise tables, but the ideas of pulling the numbers out are all the same. So we'll find the enthalpy change in three different ways and then compare those. So the first way we'll do it is just to use the C sub P for oxygen at room temperature. So we need that C sub P. Um, for those of you that do have the English version, you've got both SI and English tables in your book. I don't know, did the international version doesn't have any of the English tables, does it? I don't think so. Uh, for those of you that have both, um, the tables are just uh, A1 through whatever for the SI system and then they start over again with the exact same numbering with just a little E put after them meaning you're in the English units. So we want ideal gas, specific heats, various common gases since we're working in the English system we use A2E but the tables look exactly the same so even though it's an English problem you can still get the same idea. So we're doing oxygen. Just go down and pull C sub B right off, right off of the C sub P. Sorry, right out of the table. Uh, in English units, it's 0.219. In SI units, it would have been the 0.918. And you can even convert the units from English to uh, uh, metric if you have them. So 0.219 BTUs per pound mass ranking. And then the delta T is 1500 minus 800. And so, just a straight calculation, that's all there is to it. Um, 153 BTUs per pound mass. Same kind of units as kilojoules per kilogram, just in the English system. One way to do it. Brian? <laughs> Thinking about it? Okay, the other way, uh, another way to do it is to use the other table. Um, at the average temperature of the problem, which is what, about uh, 1150? So we can go to the next table. And again, it happens just, hey, these tables look exactly the same. It's just all the unit conversions have been done between metric and English. We go to the oxygen table down here in the corner. Go to about 1150. We want C sub P. Well, we have it at 1000. We have it at 1500. So we're about 20% of the way in between. So uh, fudge it a little bit now. Maybe make it 25. 
four, maybe something like that. Oh, that temperature's in Fahrenheit. Oh, yes. Yeah. So we need to uh, remember what to get it in Fahrenheit. <laughs> Subtract four six. So what's that? What's subtract 460? Or is that the 1150? No, that was. 690. So we'll call it 700. Because hopefully that's in the table. So that makes it easier. 700 for the oxygen. 242. So CCP was about 242. About 219, now we have about 242. <coughs> so that's going to be the error. Uh, remember, when you're talking about change in temperature, as we are here, you don't need to do unit conversion. Delta T Rankine equals delta T degrees Fahrenheit. Because that, that 460 uh, cancels out. And then the, the delta T was the same. And so what's that? 169? So, uh, different, it depends uh, on what your purpose is for this number and what resources you have. Do you have both these tables? You can make your choice. It also depends upon you, uh, how much time you've got. If you need a really quick calculation, that was the quickest way to do it. And you'll have a, a, a bit of an error, not even, well, about 10%. 10% difference. Then the third way to do it is to use the molar specific heat from that table where you've actually got those uh, got that function. And uh, I know you love to integrate This is actually a function, so you need to put in the whole function and integrate the whole thing. And that function is that third order, third order polynomial. And you just pick off the coefficients for the polynomial. There's all four coefficients there. Make sure you're in the range, which we are, 800 to 1500 is well within the range. Very little air uh, expected for the oxygen. And so uh, instead of doing anything fun this we can actually do that integral. And when you do that, you get about 170 BTUs per pound mass. It's going to take you a good half hour to do it, and you only picked up a, a little bit of difference. And then if the other way to do it is, is with ease, and just actually look up the values for H1 and H2, and it has those as properties. Yeah. This 170 BTUs per pound maxes out at one for a one percent error, and 169 is a ten percent error. Which in this? No, no, ten percent difference. Which, which one is the most right? Which one do you think? Which one had the well, smaller assumption? I thought it was that one originally. This one.
this one? No. What? What's room temperature? Uh, about 500 degrees R. So we're we're well over room temperature with these values. This is the least accurate. That's just the first one I did. It's just the least accurate. But it was also extremely quick. This one was a little bit slower because you had to average, you had to find the right temperature for the table, then you had to figure out which was the proper one of those. So that took a little bit longer. This is a little more accurate. This is probably even more accurate, and then this is probably the most accurate. But you have to have ease handy, which you will for another 11 months. What is that? That's the. Uh, that's the uh, kilograms per whack-a-mole. The uh, uh, molecular weight. You don't want to use bosses. Or uh -uh. More than I want to spend, thank you. Um, I would never, ever ever condone this, but there are um, versions out there in the world. I'm just I do not <laughs> condone that. We're just going to leave it at that. It doesn't condone the fact that they're out there. I don't deny that they're out there. I don't condone going and looking for them. So, if I catch you doing that, I'll kill you. All right, so this had better be a get out of class question. So, calorimetry tests, which are tests done to figure out the cal caloric content of certain substances, usually foods, are done something like this. Very well insulated container full of water in it is another container that holds the substance of interest. And we'll assume for our purposes it's some kind of pink cooking oil. So it's good for making cupcakes. Pink ones. <laughs> so this is a, a water bath out there. The idea being that, um, oh, and then there's a uh, enriched oxygen atmosphere inside the uh, inner container so that when a very uh, short spark is introduced, which does not count as doing work on the system, even though, yeah, we're sending this electricity, it's just it's very, very quick and it's not very much. But it's enough to ignite the oxygen atmosphere, which then burns the uh, oil. That releases heat to the water. And then a simple monitoring of the temperature of the water will allow us to figure out the change in the caloric, uh, the caloric content of the oil then. And this is exactly what they do in food labs that they then put that caloric content on the label. You know, so many calories per gram or whatever it is they happen to use. So, it's a, a closed system, which is what we've been working on for this last section. Assume no uh, kinetic or potential energy changes. Um, any of those zero? Work is zero. Remember that technically there's a little bit of work with that electricity, but it's insignificant compared to what everything else is going on. 
Well, I guess we need to define what's our system. Are we talking about this? Because yes, there is heat transfer there. Are we talking about the whole thing, which is well insulated, and there's no heat transfer? If we talk about the whole thing with no heat transfer, things come a little bit easier. Because then any change in external energy of the oil is equal and opposite to the change in internal energy of the water. And if we know what that is by the temperature change in the water, we can just figure out then what the change in the oil was. And they'll be equal and opposite since they're both internal to the system. If we take the whole system as, I mean the whole chamber as our system. So that becomes pretty easy because this is quite easy to calculate and by inference then we'll know that and that's the caloric content of the oil that we're looking for. And so we can do those two things and that'll be your get out of class question. Not, not figure out that, figure out the caloric content of the oil. I won't even make you do the hard part. Oh, you need two things, two things. You need, actually, you need a couple things. Uh, mass of the water. Two point six five kilograms. Um, T1 of the water, 25 degrees C. After the experiment's run, it goes up uh, 3 tenths of a degree. Okay, so you can figure out then the change in kinetic energy, or uh, uh, internal energy of the oil, of the water then you know that that will give you then the change in internal energy of the uh, oil. And it's metric, so nobody needs my English tables. Anybody need a table? biggest test you've got is C sub P for water. And I can't help you because I don't have any tables.
referring to common liquids. Now, is water a common liquid? That's the next question. Okay, we have a table for common liquids and substances and foods. Oh man, why did I have to bring that up right before lunch? Yeah, why? Just to torture. So it looks like table A3 is of some use. What kind of calories do you want? Well, very few. You want nutritional calories or do you want? Well, all of these calories. This is this is olive oil. So you want nutritional calories. Extra virgin olive oil. In effect, what they'll do is uh, they know how much oil is there. They put it on the label as kcal per milliliter or ounce or tablespoon or something like that. Again, we're still. Always still. Notice there's a bit of a depend temperature dependence on... Uh, on uh, the specific heat there, but it's very small. Plus, we're not work talking about very big delta T's. Which substance do you want to teach more spot? The only ones you've got. It's the water. Oh, so it's That's the temperature change of the water. Um, there you go. Oh, let me see if I have. That's a capital C. Decimal point off from what I had. Oh, no, no, wait, I'm sorry, I was looking at something different there. Uh, yeah, that's okay. So your weekend starts early. Your weekend starts early. Wait, there's trouble. Well, we need C to B. The table's got C to P. C sub B and C sub P for liquids are the same. I don't even know why there's a P uh, on that on that particular table. What that means is for liquids, that ratio K is equal to one. Yep. No. Sort of. have units. He's got. He's got. Water. He's got. Probably got C. Capital C. Yeah. Paul, we said starts early. Hurry, Paul. Put, put, put your books away and get going, man. Oh, no. I'm going to be here for a little while, so. Mm -hmm. No, you won't. Not here. We're done. You see it? 0.79 kcal. 0.79 kcal. 